Hi everyone, hope you all must be doing great. So let's start with the next chapter in our revision series. Now we'll, uh, we are starting with the chapter house property. It's a very small chapter at the same time interesting and at the same time very important also. Because in an examination, you generally see questions coming from this chapter. So it comprises of very few sections, starts from section 22 of Income Tax Act till uh, 27. So section 22 is a charging section for house property. So let's understand what are the contents of this chapter so that we can easily comprehend this chapter. Okay. So the first section is section 22. Section 22 is the charging section of house property. It says a very simple things that if there is a building and assessing the owner, then the income would be taxable under the head house property that we will see. So section 22 is a charging section. Section 23 tells you how to compute your house property income especially your gross annual value because whenever we have to compute our house property income first we will be calculating our GAV gross annual value then we will be subtracting municipal taxes paid then we will receive NAV and from NAV there are deductions available under section 24. So section 24 are the deductions which are available from your net annual value and you know that there are two deductions 24A and 24B that we will talk about. Next section is section 25 that says deductions will not be allowed. So when deduction will not be allowed, actually house property gives you only two deductions. One is statutory deduction, standard deduction 24A. Second is interest deduction. So section 25 will tell you when this interest will not be allowed. If you are paying outside India, then you should deduct TDS on that particular interest. Otherwise it will not be allowed. Or if you are not deducting TDS, but the agent of that particular non-resident is in India, then it is fine. So that also I'll discuss section 25, a very small section. Then comes section 25A. 25A is recovery of unrealized rent or areas of rent. So whenever you recover your unrealized rent or areas of rent, how you will treat that in your house property chapter, that will also see in section 25A. Second last section is co-ownership, section 26, which says that if there is a property which is owned by two or more owners, so how you will treat that particular house property income in the hands of each co-owner section 26 will tell us and the last section is section 27 that is deemed ownership. Why this concept is there deemed ownership because our charging section section 22 says that if there is a building in the assess is the owner. If the assess is the real owner then also it will be taxed under house property but if assess is a deemed owner also because there are certain cases where we see that assessee is not the actual real owner, real registered owner, but he is supposed to be a deemed owner. So what are the cases where we can say that here the assessee is not actually a registered owner, but yes, we will assume that he is a deemed to be the owner of that property. So these cases are covered under section 27. So these are the contents of this chapter and also there are some miscellaneous and other provisions like vacancy if the house is vacant at any time during the year. So how you will treat that vacancy period and there is another concept like composite rent. Composite rent means when whenever you uh, let out your building with some extra services or with extra assets and tenant gives you a lump sum rent which is including of your building as well as for other assets or services. So that is a composite rent. How we will treat that? That we will see. The next one is property. If a, there is a house property which is situated outside India. So if a property is situated outside India, whether it is taxable, the answer could be yes. When? If the assessee, it depends upon the assessee. If the assessee is an ordinary resident, then we understand that if the assessee is an ordinary resident, then their global income is taxable. So even if the property is situated outside India, that will be treated as a house that we will come under house property income, right? And second thing, if that assessee is not an ordinary resident, so why we will be taxing any income which is arising outside India? Only in the case when it is received in India. So if the assessee is a non-resident or the assessee is a not ordinary resident, in that case, if there is any income which is coming from a property which is outside India, but it is received in India. You understand this uh, first chapter which uh, we did of residential, the second chapter which we did of residential status and scope of total income, where we have uh, already covered that any income which arises in India is taxable. 
and also any income which is received in India, not remitted, received in India is also taxable. So that is how this income could also be taxable if the property is situated outside India. And the last is if there is a property which is used differently. Let's say one portion of the property you are using it for your self occupation. You have on a self occupied that property. Second part or other part of the property you have let out or might be there is one portion of the property which you are using for your own business or profession. So in that case, if there is a single property, but it has different portions and you are using each portion differently, then how we will be going to compute that income under the house property or PGVP also, because sometimes you use that particular portion for business or a profession, then how we will be treating that. So these are all the topics which we have to cover under the this chapter house property. Got it? So let's start with the first section, section 22. So if you will see, if you come to your book, I believe you have already downloaded this book. This uh, book is uh, you can easily download in PDF format from the website rajatmoga.com under download section. Okay. Section 22 is a charging section for house property. It's a charging section for house property. Similarly, we have uh, in salary, we have section 15 as a charging section. In PGBP, we'll do section 28 as a charging section. So here, section 22 is the charging section for house property. It says a very, inter very interesting things. First of all, there should be a building. First of all, there should be a building. Building means any built up structure. It is not necessary that it should be a very big or tall building. No. It could be even a room or a two, two room apartment that is also a building, right? Any built structure is a building. But if it is a entirely a vacant land, then it is not a building, right? Because if you are getting rent of a, a vacant land, in that case, that uh, rent will be taxable under the head IFOS, income from other sources. But if it is there as a building, then the income will be taxed under the head house property. But there are other conditions also. Yes, if there is a land attached to that building, then it is okay. We'll keep it in house property, right? So there must be a building and the land can be attached to that building or not. That is okay with us, right? So first thing first, charging section says there must be a building with or without land. It's okay. But if it is entirely a vacant land, no, in that case, IFOS, okay. Second thing is that the assessee must be the owner of the building. If assessee is not the owner of the building, we are not going to tax that income under that house property because you understand there is something known as subletting. When uh, let's say Mr. A is a tenant, he uh, takes a property on rent and he further sublets that property to someone else. So in that case, that income which he is getting because he is not the owner. So in that case, it will not be taxed under that house property. It will go in IFS or other. Uh, head generally IFS sub subletting of income, but yes, if subletting is the main business of uh, the SSE, it could can go to PGBP also, but generally keep it IFS, right? Okay, so SSE must be the owner of the building or a deemed owner also, as defined in section 27. We will see in section 27 there are different cases where the SSE is said to be a deemed owner. So if the SSE is the owner of the building, including deemed owner also. So first thing first. Charging section says there must be a building plus the assessee must be the owner or deemed owner. Third and important thing is that that building should be used for any purpose other than business or profession, other than your own business. Assessee should not use this building for their own business or profession, right? So if they are using it for your for their own business and profession, so any income or any expense related to that building will go under the head PGBP. It will not come under house property. So SSE must not use that building for their own business and profession. I'm saying their own business and profession, right? If they have let out to some tenant, if tenant is using for their business, that is it, it is okay. That is SSE is not using in business. Tenant is using in his business. It's okay. It's tenant's business, right? But who the uh, person who is the owner of the building or the deemed owner of the, of the building should not use for their own business and profession. Got it? Because otherwise that income or any expense on that building or any income on that building will go to PGBP. Because we understand there are different situations when assessee can use a building for their own business. Let's say if assessee has a factory, 
that factory factories are building factories being used in his business so whatever the expenses which he would be incurring on that factory building that would be your pgvp expense or any income if might be uh, deriving from that building would be your pgvp income similarly if assessee let's say assessee is a factory and he has so many workers or so many managers or officers and to some managers he provides a rent free accommodation and that accommodation is owned by the employer that accommodation is owned by that factory that company or that organization so if they let out sorry if they uh, let's say if they give on concessional rent to their employees so why they have given it on concessional rent or rent free accommodation because these employees work for our company to save their time to save the time of commutation between their home let's say their home is very far away so to save that time to save that energy to be more productive so that they can be more productive in our business so that is the reason for our business purpose we give such type of perquisite such type of uh, accommodation to our employees so in that case if we are recovering any rent let's say concessional rent even concess concessional rent if we are recovering it from our employees so that income will go will be taxable under pgvp not under house property why because that building is being used for business purpose right because you have employees uh, are for your business purpose and if you are giving anything for them to them then this is only for the business purpose right even it might happen that uh, you uh, give you have a very large factory or a very large company where so many employees who work uh, in your company so uh, what you do is you approach a bank and you say uh, please, bank please open a branch in my premises please open a small branch in my premises so all my employees all my workers can easily operate their bank account or might be you might be needing that bank's banking services so you approach any of the bank branches that please open a small branch in my organization and uh, you can and you ask that branch you tell that branch that uh, you can uh, serve my uh, workers also and you can serve your other customers also other customers can also come who are not my employees they can also come here but yes primarily it is for your business so if you are getting rent out of it if you are getting rent out of it why you have given it to that bank branch in your premises because you would like your business to run smoothly so that is the reason that income which you will receive from that bank branch the rent which that bank branch will be paying to you that will be your pgvp income or it could be a bank branch or any of the government office if you approach any post office uh, you approach that please open a small counter over here and you can give us rent so in that case that income is also pgvp income also it might happen that let's say you are you have a factory you uh, manufacture certain goods and for that you need raw material and your raw material supplier is situated very far away so it takes a uh, lot of time for, uh, for the raw material to come to your factory so what you do is you approach your supplier you say uh, sir instead of uh, manufacturing the raw material at your premises why don't you come at my premises you just take a small room uh, in my premises and you manufacture those um, raw raw material and i can easily purchase from here itself so that manufacturer that raw material supplier will uh, will uh, take a small room and he might pay you rent also so in that case if you are getting a rent of that building that small room or two rooms so in that case that is something which is ancillary to to your business so the rent which you are receiving from that supplier of raw material because he is now in your he is using your premises so why you have given it to him so that your business can run smoothly efficiently quickly you can produce you can acquire your raw, raw material so it is helping in your business so in that case that income which you are getting from that ancillary units is your business income so i have already mentioned it over here the following income will be taxable under pgvv building let out to the employees or building let out to any government agencies for smooth functioning like banks etc building let out to ancillary units i have already discussed raw material supplier or assessee is engaged in the business of let out of properties it might happen that the main objective of the business is letting out of the property there was a case also supreme court case of royala corporation private limited you don't have to remember this case law but still for reference i have given it here that this assessee this company in their memorandum of association they have already specifically written as an objective of the business was to let out the building 
so if you are purely and purely in the business of letting out of any building so in that case also that income will be taxed under the head pgvp not under the head house property so i was discussing the third point of charging section that assessee should not use that building for business and profession if they are using it for business and profession it will go in pgvp otherwise if they are not using it for business or profession they are using it for any other purpose then it will go in house property right and i have given you some examples also when the business is said to be used for business purpose right but i have mentioned that a person who has their main business the objective of the business is letting out of building in that case it is pgvp income but you understand that there are builders also like dlf like supertech they, these are builders they build uh, apartments they build flats and they used to sell their flats so their main objective is letting out or selling off their uh, houses or flats so they sell these apartments but sometime it might happen that uh, the real estate market is not that booming up let's say for any year so what they do is they because these buildings are their stock in trade right so they let out those uh, the, the, uh, their stock their building they let out their building for the time being till the time it is not getting sold they let let out for the time being so their business was letting out or their business was selling those flats their business was selling of their those flats so if for the time being if they let out so the income which they will receive would be taxable under the head house property not pgbp because they are not in the business of letting out if they would have been the in the business of letting out like let um, i have mentioned like in the case of royal corporation in that case it would be pgvp but here they are just letting their stock in trade for the time being till the time it is not getting sold so that will be house property income only okay so i have mentioned it here house property held as stock in trade it would be a house property income very important note is mentioned over here that house property income will be taxable only on due basis only on due basis remember in salary what we have discussed we have discussed that salary could be taxed on due basis or receipt basis whichever is earlier that means in salary if you receive advance salary also before it gets due then also it will it will be taxable in the year of receipt due or receipt whichever is earlier but here please note that house property income here will be taxable only and only on due basis even if you have received rent in advance please don't tax that rent in advance it will be taxed only on only when it is due right so house property is on due basis okay so this was section 22 charging section first thing building owner or deemed owner third thing it should not be used for business or profession section 23 says how you will compute your house property income so please stick to this format i believe that you must have also done this Uh, format only so first of all you have to calculate your gross annual value first of all calculate your gav how you will calculate your gav we'll see it in a couple of minutes first of all calculate your gav from gav deduct municipal taxes actually paid during the previous year by the owner municipal taxes actually paid actually paid means if it is just due and you have not paid them it is unpaid please you cannot deduct it you can only deduct those municipal taxes which are paid during the previous year our previous year for 2024 examination is previous year 23 24 so it means that any municipal tax any municipal tax which is paid from 1st april 2023 till 31st march 2024 that will only be allowed that will only be allowed i can say in simple terms that municipal taxes will be allowed only on payment basis only on cash basis right if you have paid on third on 1st of april 2024 that is next year even it is before the due date of roi please don't look at the due date of roi over here that is a subject matter of pgvp right but here we don't look at the due date of roi it should be uh paid specifically in the previous year itself in the previous year itself even if it is paid on first april like next day of the previous year please don't allow it examiner might confuse you he will say that boss these expenses this municipal taxes are paid before the due date of roi 
that is PGBP concept. But here in house property, you will only allow if it is paid up to 31st March 2024, right? It might relate to any year. It is allowed only on payment basis, right? And it should be paid by the owner. If tenant has paid these municipal taxes, please don't allow it. If tenant has paid, please don't allow it. Only those expenses should be deducted, which is paid by the owner, right? So first we have to compute GAV. After that, after deducting municipal taxes, we will get NAV that we call net annual value. This is NAV. From NAV, there are two deductions available. There is no other deduction will be available if the owner has spent something on repairs, they have spent something on insurance. We don't give any such deductions in house property. We give only two deductions. One is a standard or a statutory deduction of 30%. So one is a standard deduction of 30% of NAV. Whatever is your NAV will give you 30% deductions flat. And second is your interest on loan. Whatever if you have uh, taken a loan uh, for that house. Why? If you have taken a loan to purchase that house or to construct that house. Even for repairs, renewal or reconstruction, if you have taken a loan for that particular house for which you are calculating house property income, not for any other house, for that which you are calculating your house property income. If for that particular house you have taken a loan for acquisition, that is purchase or for construction or for repairs, renewals, reconstruction, etc., then you can deduct interest under section 24B that we will see in detail. Right. So after deducting these expenses, examiner will confuse you. He will say that assessee has paid repair of the house, assessee has paid insurance of the house, this much as the depreciation of the house. Please don't fall under that trap. Only 24A and 24B will be allowed. And after deducting these expenses, these deductions, you will get income under the head house property. This is a very small, sweet, simple format. Right. So GAV, municipal taxes paid, NAV, and from NAV, deductions under section 24, house property income, that's it. So whatever is your NAV, give 30% flat deduction. Let's say in some cases, the NAV will be nil also, right? So in that case, the 30% of nil would be obviously be nil. But yes, interest could be allowed. But we will see in 24B that if it is a self-occupied property where we take NAV as nil, then 24B is allowed only under optional scheme and default scheme. It is not allowed. We will see it later. In today's class only we will see. Okay. So first of all, we understand how we will compute your GAV because GAV is a starting point for calculating your house property income. GAV is a starting point. Yes, of course, uh, while calculating your self-occupied property, NAV becomes starting point. But generally speaking, uh, for uh, any other house property which is let out or deemed to be let out, GAV is a starting point. So gross annual value is the starting point. How you will be computing your GAV? GAV would be higher of the two limits. What is it? Your expected rent or actual rent, whichever is higher. Expected rent could also be known as a notional rent. You can also say it as an annual letting value. It can, it has different names. Generally, we use expected rent. You can also use annual letting value or uh, notional rent. So expected rent, annual letting value or notional rent any by any name or actual rent received or receivable. Why receivable? Because we understand that house property income is taxed on due basis. So even if you have not received rent, but it is receivable, then also you can consider that rent also. So expected rent or actual rent, whichever is higher, whichever is higher will become your GAV. How we will be computing my expected rent or annual letting value or notional rent? So in that case, we see your municipal valuation or municipal value or fair rental value, whichever is higher. So municipal value or fair rental value, whichever is higher. But yes, if there is a standard rent also given in the question, then you will compare with the standard rent, whichever is lower, right? So municipal rent or fair rent, whichever is higher, compare it. If standard rent is not available, you can ignore it. But if standard rent is available, then compare it with standard rent, whichever is lower. And you understand what is this def definition is not that important for examination point of view, but you understand what is municipal rental value, fair rental value, fair rental value is uh, something which similar property uh, can generate the rent, this, uh, the rent in the same, which is situated in the same locality, standard rent and all definition is not required. You can simply read them once. Okay. So I have already discussed which uh, house property, which is situated outside India. So you understand. If this property is situated outside India and the assessee is an ordinary resident, 
then their global income is taxable so this income will also be taxable if the assessee is an ordinary resident and if nothing is mentioned about the residential status in the question please always assume that assessee is an ordinary resident right but if the assessee if the, it is mentioned in the question that assessee is a non resident or it is mentioned that assessee is a not ordinary resident in that case if the property is situated outside india so such income can only be taxed if that income that rent is received in india right so if it is resident and ordinary resident then there is no problem it is always taxable because we understand global income is taxable but if the assessee is a not ordinary resident if it is mentioned in the question that assessee is a not ordinary resident or it is given you, you know, the, or they have given you the number of days or the, or that information so that you can calculate uh, or determine the residential status in that case if the status comes out to be a not ordinary resident or non resident in that case taxable when rent is received in india right if it is received in india because it is not arising in india because anyways the property situated outside india so it is not arising in india but yes if it is received not remitted directly received in india then we will tax that income also in the hands of not ordinary or non resident also okay very important how you will treat if there is a vacancy period first of all you have to understand what is vacancy vacancy is a period where no one is occupying your property no one is occupying your property not even tenant is occupying it or neither you are occupying it you means you or your family member that is it is not even self occupied vacancy you can understand uh, by this example that vacancy is something where your house is locked where is your house is locked that is you are not deriving any benefit neither you or your any of your family member is staying in that house it is locked or neither it is let out so that is a period of vacancy so how we will treat if uh, uh, your question comes regarding that uh, this property was let out for 10 months and 2 months it was vacant so how you will be treating your how you will be computing your gav first of all we know that generally gav is higher of the two which is expected rent or actual rent actual rent received or receivable which we call it arr so gav is higher of the two expected rent or arr whichever is higher so let's say let let me take an example that your property is let out for 10 months and for two months it was vacant for two months it was vacant vacant means it was locked tenant has already vacated that property and you are also you or any your family member is also not occupied that property it is not self-occupied also so neither let out nor self-occupied it is locked that is vacant so two months it was vacant so we understand gav is higher of the two expected rent or actual rent so if in case if the property is vacant uh, for two months so actual rent would be for 10 months only actual rent would be for 10 months only and expected rent would be for the entire year right because expected rent is the municipal value parental value whichever is higher limited to standard rent whichever is lower so expected rent would be your 12 months so these are not comparable right because actual rent is just for 10 months even if first of all just compare expected rent and actual rent if actual rent is higher then there is no problem we will say actual rent is gav even if even if it is for 10 months and even if it is higher then we will say nothing there is no problem jv would be the actual rent but in case expected rent is higher you will say sir obviously expected rent could be higher because it is for 12 months and actual rent is of 10 10 months so in that case what you have to do is you have to see whether expected rent is higher is it due to vacancy only or or due to any other parameter so how you will see it it's a it's a very uh, simple method to see this so what you will do is you will just for comparison purpose just for comparison purpose you will compute the proportionate expected rent by subtracting that vacancy period i'm again repeating in case of vacancy first of all see what is the expected rent what is the actual rent although we understand expected rent is of 12 months actual rent in my example it is 10 uh, actual rent is 10 months because two months it was vacant so in case actual rent is higher then there is no problem you will say gav is actual rent but in case expected rent is higher so first of all you will say sir this comparison is not correct it should also be we have to subtract the vacancy period also so what you will do is you will subtract the vacancy period and you will compute the proportionate expected rent that we can say is per how you will do it let's say expected rent comes out to be 120000 
Do you understand? One lakh twenty thousand is for the entire twelve months. So please subtract that vacancy period. So two months we have to subtract. So whatever what you will do is just uh, come out with a figure which is related to ten months. So you will say, sir, one lakh twenty thousand is for the entire year. That is divided by twelve into ten. So you will receive one lakh. So one lakh is the proportionate expected rent, right? So if actual rent is higher, there is no problem. You can directly say actual rent is GAV. But as P, if expected rent is higher, then please, for comparison purpose, compute proportionate expected rent. And how you will be computing your PER by reducing the vacancy period. I am again repeating by reducing the vacancy period. Okay. So if Compare PER with actual rent. If PER is higher, if PER is still higher, you will say that the GAV would be PER or ER. You will say ER. PER is proportionate expected rent is just for comparison purpose. You will say that GAV is ER, right? So in that case, uh, let's say I give you an example. Let's say the property is uh, let out for let out for 10 months it is self occupied for one month and it is vacant for one month so total 12 months we have 10 months let out one month self occupied one month vacant tell me how much is the vacancy only one month only one month is the vacancy right so when once you will be computing your per how you will do it you will say per let's say one lakh twenty thousand is the per divided by 12 into 10 or into 11 you have to reduce only the vacancy period please don't reduce the self-occupied period no only the vacancy period you have to reduce so you will compute per for 11 months because out of 12 only one month was vacant right 10 months was let out one month was self-occupied one month was vacant so compute per for 11 months and then compute per then compare per and actual rent so if actual rent is higher there is no problem you will say actual rent would be the GAV. If PER is higher, if P is R, R is higher, then please say GAV is expected rent. Please go back to the expected rent for the full year, right? Don't go for PER. PER is just for comparison purpose. So here I have also mentioned the steps as well. That first of all, if there is vacancy, compute PER. So how you will compute PER? Only reduce the vacancy period. Only reduce the vacancy period. Please don't reduce any self-occupied or other period. Only reduce the vacancy period to uh, calculate the PER. Step two is compare PER and ARR. If actual rent is higher, then there is no problem. Then ARR is would be the GAV. But if PER is higher, then GAV would be ER, not PER. It would be ER, right? So please remember this thing. This is something which is important. And I know that you must have also done uh, questions on this. If uh, you don't remember it, it's been a um, time now. So please revise those questions also. Next important point is treatment of unrealized rent. What is unrealized rent? Unrealized rent is bad debts. Whenever you have given your um, property on rent to a tenant and he was paying rent, but it might happen that for any month that person has not paid the rent to you and he runs away or you have vacated the property because he's not paying rent. So in that case, if he's not paying rent and this amount becomes unrealized, it will be known as unrealized rent. We can say it bad debts commonly. So what are the conditions of bad debt? First, you should understand. So this can come in your theory. So conditions of unrealized rent is that, first of all, the tenancy must be genuine. You have given this uh, property on rent on a, in a good faith. In a good faith, you have given that my tenant is a, is a genuine person. He will be giving me rent timely, but it happens that it turns out to be a bad debt, right? So, but initially you have given your property in a good faith, in a bona fide manner. Second is that the defaulting tenant has vacated the property. The person who was, uh, who has not paid you the rent, he has vacated the property or steps have been taken to get the property vacated because you know that you will not be recovering rent. He will not be paying rent. So you have already uh, told him that please leave my property. Third point is that he should not have occupied any of your other property. He should not occupy any of your other property, right? So third point says such defaulting tenant has not occupied any other property. And the fourth point is that 
you have taken all reasonable legal steps you have already taken and you satisfy the AO, sir, there is no point in taking further steps now. It will be useless. It would be worthless because I have taken all reasonable legal steps as well. So if these conditions are satisfied, then the rent can set to be a unrealized rent. So this is for theoretical purpose that you should know about, you should be aware of these four points. The tenancy is bona fide, the defaulting tenant has vacated the property or steps have been taken to get the property vacated. Third is that person has not occupied any of our other property also. And the fourth point is that you have taken all reasonable legal steps and you satisfy the AO. So there is no point in taking further steps now, right? So this is unrealized rent. So if there is unrealized rent, how you will be treating it in your uh, while computing your house property income? So what is your actual rent received or receivable? Because that amount is receivable, but now you will not going to receive it. So just subtract that unrealized rent from that. So from ARR, from actual rent received or receivable, just subtract that unrealized rent so that you can get a net ARR. I can say it as a net ARR, right? So your ARR will be subtracted by unrealized rent. So it will become net ARR. So GAV would be, now you will compare expected rent and net ARR. So here you will, we were computing as ARR. So you can keep it as net ARR. That is after deducting your uh, unrealized rent. So net ARR or ER, whichever is higher. Okay. Next come to this. So this was section 23. So we did section 22. We have already covered section 22 is uh, charging section of house property. Section 23, we know how we will compute our house property income. GAV minus municipal taxes paid by the owner, NAV. From NAV, we will deduct 24A, 24B so that we can compute our house property income. So let's discuss the deductions under uh, from net annual value. What are the deductions? What are 24A and 24B? So we understand 24A is a flat deduction of 30%. It's, a, it's called a standard deduction in house property that 30%, whatever is the NAV, we will deduct 30%, right? But in case if NAV is nil, 30% of a zero amount would again be zero, right? So 24A is simple deduction, a flat deduction of 30%. 24B is a interest on borrowing. If you have borrowed a loan, if you have borrowed something, to purchase the house, to construct the house for repairs, renovation, etc. So the interest, that interest portion is allowed under section 24B. This 24B interest is allowed on due basis also. It is allowed on due basis. Even if you have not paid the interest, then also it is allowed under house property. You remember in PGBP, we will discuss that in PGBP, if you have taken loan from banks or financial institution, so it should be paid. It should be on a payment basis. Otherwise, 43B will disallow it. That we will see in PGBP. But here, even if the interest is not paid, then also it will be allowed under Section 24B because interest here is allowed on due basis, right? Interest here is allowed on due basis. Second thing, some of the important points are uh, here in 24B is, let's say you have taken a loan from any bank. You have purchased a property. You have taken a loan from ICIC Bank of 20 lakh rupees. So 20 lakh is the principal amount if you have taken a loan at a rate of let's say 10% per annum. So whatever the 10% per annum is the interest that will be allowed under section 24B. But let's say after one year, you come to know that there is another bank, let's say HDFC is offering you a loan at 8% per annum. So what you can do is because you have already a loan which you have taken to purchase the house or construct the house from ICICI bank, but that was a expensive rate of interest of 10%. So you would like to shift that loan from ICICI bank to HDFC bank. Can you do this? The answer is yes, you can do this. So let's say if you have shifted your principal amount from ICICI to HDFC, so what you will approach at HDFC, you will do some formalities. They will ask you with, the, with some documents. And uh, they will pay off ICIC loan and now the loan is from HDFC. So this is called balance transfer. So if now you are paying, you will be paying the interest to HDFC bank. Whether this, this interest will also be allowed, the answer is yes. It, this loan has just replaced the original loan. This loan has just replaced the original loan. So this loan will also be eligible. The interest on such loan will also be allowed under section 24P. So balance transfer is okay. But yes. If you have taken a loan to repay the interest, that is not allowed here. 
you in my example hdfc loan you have taken to repay that principal loan right to repay that uh, icic bank loan so hdfc has repaid that loan and now the loan is from hdfc right but if you have taken a loan to repay the interest then that that interest is not allowed let's say give you an example let's say you have a loan from sbi of rupees 10 lakh at a rate of let's say 12 percent per annum and the interest is 1 lakh 20 thousand see this 1 lakh 20 thousand is allowed under section 24b even if you have not paid it, it will be allowed on due basis that is fine but as if you have not paid it will be allowed under 24b that is okay but sbi will demand this interest right sbi will say please give me this interest so let's say if the assessee doesn't have money to repay this interest so what will assessee do assessee might go to any other bank let's say assessee will go to pnb and they will ask pnb can you give me 1 lakh 20 thousand loan they have taken a 1 lakh 20 thousand loan pnb say okay we will give you a loan of 1 lakh 20 thousand at a rate of let's say 10 percent and we will charge 12,000 interest, right? So you have taken a loan from PNB for what, which purpose you have taken a loan to repay the interest. So this loan is not eligible. So if you will say, sir, 12,000 is also allowed in 24B, you will say no, because this loan you have taken to repay the principal or the interest. You have taken this loan to repay the interest. So this interest on interest is not allowed, right? So uh, this I've already covered fresh loan taken to repay the original loan. My HDFC example, that is allowed. It's okay. But loan taken to repay the interest is not allowed. My PNB example, no, it is. it will not be allowed, right? Interest on principal is allowed, but however, interest on interest is not allowed. Okay. Sometimes it happens that you take a loan from the builder itself, from the seller itself, you take the loan. Let's say if you are purchasing a property, let's say you are purchasing a property, you are purchasing a flat. You are purchasing a flat. This the value of this flat is let's say 40 lakh rupees. And um, you are of the opinion that you have 10 lakh rupees right now. You have 10 lakh rupees right now. So you pay this 10 lakh rupees as a down payment. And 30 lakh rupees, you go to bank and you take a loan, a home loan. You have taken a home loan from the bank, right? So interest on such amount is allowed. Because we understand that a loan taken for uh, purchasing the property, for construction of the property, repairs and reconstruction, etc., that is allowed. So whatever the bank will charge interest, you will say it is allowed under Section 24B. Okay. Now it might happen that the person who is selling you this particular property, let's say there is a builder, there is a builder, he is selling you this property. He will say, okay, this property is of 40 lakh. You have 10 lakh. Pay, pay the down payment to me. And 30 lakh builder is offering that there is no need to go to the bank to take the loan. I will give you the loan. I will give you the loan. So you pay to me. You keep on paying me in installments. Yes, I will charge you interest. I will charge you interest. So that is also fine. There is no problem in this. If we have taken a loan from the bank or from the seller itself, that is okay. We can also say that this is the unpaid purchase price because we have paid out of 40, we have. 40 is the purchase price out of 40 we have paid 10 lakh 30 lakh is an unpaid purchase price how that that builder has made an arrangement they have made an arrangement they have converted this unpaid purchase price into installments with interest so whether that interest is also allowed that is okay it is allowed because it is same it is of the same nature as if we would be taking loan from any other bank we have taken the loan from the builder itself from the seller itself so it is perfectly fine. We can uh, deduct 24B. We can allow 24B on such interest also. That is why it is mentioned that interest on unpaid purchase price is also a loan covered under this section. Such interest is also allowed. Right. And I've already covered 24B is allowed on due basis. Pre-construction period interest is also allowed. Pre-construction period interest is also allowed. And you understand it is allowed in five equal installments. Whatever is the pre-construction period interest, we calculate that. We will divide it by 5 and we will give that deduction also from the year when the property was constructed and for another 4 years that is total 5 years. So pre-construction period interest is allowed in 5 equal installments. So you have to calculate pre-construction period interest. 
so let me also because some students might find this uh, confusing how we'll calculate a pre-construction period interest and that is i tell you again a very easy topic so what is pre-construction period interest whenever you purchase let's say you have a land you have a land and you would like to build a house over there but you don't have money so if you borrow this money from the bank you borrow the money from the bank let's say you borrow from sbi let's say you need 20 lakh to construct that property so it is just a land you approach bank bank will ask for the documents if you are the owner of the land they will ask you that papers they will ask you about your income proof so many documents so if you furnish all these documents and bank find that it is okay to give the loan they will give you a loan so let's say SBI gives you a loan of 20 lakh rupees at a rate of 12 percent and the date is on this loan was given to you on let's say first of february 2021 they provide you with the loan right now you started you you now you have received the loan now the construction is started so it might it might take for uh, constructing a building uh, construction for constructing a house it might take one year two year three years also right it might take some time so your house is finally constructed on house construction was completed on Fifteenth of October, twenty twenty-three. So this is the date when the house was completed. So your house property is completed on this date. This is the time when Section twenty-two would first be attracted because Section twenty-two charging section says there must be a building because prior to that there was no building, right? So Section twenty-two was not there in in this year twenty-one. Neither in Section twenty, uh, neither in the year section uh, in the year twenty twenty-two it was not there. So it was first time whenever your building is constructed now, now section 22 will be attracted. But the question is, will the SBI will start your interest from 15th October or they will start their interest from 1st February 2021? They will start the interest from this date, right? Because they have given you the loan, they will start your interest from this date. So what is the pre-construction period? We can easily say, a layman will say, so the pre-construction period is, we have started uh, the, the, we have taken this loan from this date so the interest was started from 1st february 2021 this is the start date of the loan and the house was finally completed on 15th october 2023 so before this it was pre-construction after this this is post-construction a layman will say like this it's okay okay so because be before that there was no house it was just under construction. So this is pre, this is post. But please remember how you will find the pre-construction. Here, there is a little difference over here in house property. What we do is, first of all, and it is very easy to compute. First of all, just let me know the date on which the house is completed. So 15th October 2023 is the date when this house was completed, right? Tell me the previous year in which did this date is falling. The simple the previous year in which this date is falling is previous year 23 24 so what you have to do is i'm again repeating just get that date on which the house was completed the building was completed so it was 15th october what was the previous year this date was falling in previous year 23 24 just remember this thing so for the previous year there will be no pre-construction period all days related to this year all days starting from 1st april 2023 it will be in our post period it will be computed in our post period so before that you can go you can say that it is pre-construction technically speaking our pre-construction was from 1st february till 15th october but for house property for this pre-construction period interest which we calculated in our house property chapter we take this previous year in which this house was completed we or that building was completed the entire previous year is taken as a part of post period not pre period so from 1st april 23 your post period will start so april 23 april may june july all this is post period although technically speaking i know the house was completed the building was completed on 15th october so whether this april april 23 may 23 june 23 should it be taken as 
post period the answer is yes technically it is a layman will say no but still we will say it yes this entire previous year will go in your post period and before that before that which is the date 31st march 2023 so 31st march 2023 this is considered as the pre period so pre construction period is from 1st february 2021 Till 31st March 2023. So you have to calculate the interest of this period. This is known as pre-construction period. And this period interest is allowed in five equal installments starting from this year in which the property is completed and another four years that total five years. Correct? Easy. So interest, pre-construction period interest, you understand how it will be computed. Interest on self-occupied property is also allowed. You, because we understand that for self-occupied property, we can take the NAV as nil. Here, we, we don't start with GAV. Here, the starting point is NAV. So, even if there is a self-occupied property, what is a self-occupied property? Which is 100% self-occupied during the entire year. Even it is even it is not let out even for a very, uh, even for a single day. It is not let out even for a single day, right? If it is let out for even for one day, then it will not be considered as a self-occupied property. NAV we cannot take nil. But if it is and for the entire year, it is occupied as a self-occupied property, whether you are staying it or any of your family member is staying it, that's it's okay. So it is considered as a self-occupied property. Here you can take NAV as nil. And 24A standard deduction will obviously be, be nil because NAV is nil, 30% of 0 would be 0. 24B, if you are paying interest on that, can you allow that interest also? Here, it is very important to note it that if the assessee is following default tax regime, I can also say it as a new tax regime. I can also say it as 115 BAC. So if the assessee is following default tax regime, then no deduction of 24B is allowed for self-occupied property. Please remember, please remember, if the assessee is following default tax regime, 24B is not allowed. But yes, if the assessee is following, following a optional tax regime, they are following optional tax regime, in that case, 24B is allowed. In that case, 24B is allowed. But yes, in that case, the maximum limit is 2 lakh or in some cases, 30,000 also. Right, but if the assessee is following default tax regime, please don't allow 24k. Right, but if it is optional scheme, then only it is allowed. But yes, there is a limit. First, let out property or deemed to be let out property, there is no limit for 24k, and it is allowed under both the regimes. But let out or deemed let out, it is okay. There is no limit and allowed also in both the regimes. But in if the NAV is nil, it is a self-occupied property, then 24b is limited. To 2 lakh or 30,000, we will see that, but only under optional scheme. A new scheme will even not allow even a single penny, right? So, self occupied property where the entire year it is self occupied, not let out even for a single day. Here we can take NAV as nil, and the starting point should be nil, NAV nil, right? Even if the assessee has paid municipal taxes, you what you will do of municipal taxes, you will ignore that. Just please write a note over there because here we have to take NAV as nil. So we cannot take municipal taxes because municipal taxes are deducted before that, right? Uh, it is deducted from GAV. So you the starting point is generally for house property is GAV, but for self-occupied property, it would be NAV and there is no scope to deduct municipal taxes. So municipal taxes are not allowed in case the property is self-occupied where you are taking it NAV as nil, right? Second important thing is that for individual and HUF, they have a special advantage. They can take two properties as a self-occupied property, right? Deduction under section 24B for self-occupied property. If you are following default scheme, I'm again repeating, there is no deduction allowed. But yes, if the assessee is following optional scheme, then deduction is allowed. So if the loan is taken before 1st April 1999, that is loan is taken on or before 31st March 1999, right? I believe most of uh, you were not born by this date or near about this date. Okay. So if the loan is taken before 1st April 1999, that is up to 31st March 1999, and it is a self-occupied property, then the maximum reduction is 30,000. The maximum reduction is 30,000. But if the loan is taken after this date, after first, on or after 1st April 1999, then the deduction is allowed. To 2 lakh also and some in some cases 30,000 also but generally it is 2 lakh 
when if the property is is if the loan is taken for purchase or construction please understand this is very easy please apply logic see mr a is taking loan for purchase of the house or construction of the house for purchase or construction you need more money right mr b is taking loan for repair of the house he needs less money correct so if it is purchase or construction you need more money more deduction would be allowed and if you are just uh taking loan for repairs renovation etc you need less money less uh, deduction will be allowed so if it it is for purchase and construction deduction will be 2 lakh for other purpose it is 30000 right and also for purchase and construction it is 2 lakh provided provided the construction is completed within 5 years the construction must be completed within 5 years generally constructions gets completed in 2 or 3 years but still they have said the construction but there are two conditions if you want to claim 2 lakh deduction this is when when it is a self occupied property it is if it is a let out property or deemed let out property there is no problem you can allow any limit you can allow any limit under both the regimes but in uh, self occupied property in optional regime the maximum deduction is 2 lakh provided the loan is borrowed after on or after 1st april 1999 second thing is that it is for purchase or construction of the property and the property is constructed within 5 years within 5 years from which date you should take the 5 years the date on which you have taken the loan come to the end of that financial year come to that the end of that uh, previous year and from that date you have to take 5 years right so acquisition construction is completed within 5 years from the end of the financial year in which the loan is taken maximum deduction is 2 lakh but if the loan is taken for other purpose the deduction will be 30000 or even if this condition is not satisfied the deduction would be 30000 only if let's say the construction is completed beyond 5 years it it has took it took 6 years 7 years or so in that case also 30000 deduction will be allowed but yes please remember 24b this is very important it can come in your mcq or in your any of the any a uh, point in your descriptive question also in practical question also it can come please remember if you are following default tax regime do not give 24b deduction in case of default tax regime if the property is self occupied if it is let out then no, it is allowed but if it is self occupied then it is not allowed get got it okay section 25 deduction not allowed if you are paying interest if you are paying interest and this interest is paying being paid outside india then you should deduct tds if tds is not deducted this 24b will not be allowed or if in case tds is not deducted why because of the reason that person has a agent in india that agent provision we actually uh, this is a point which is related to ca finance but still just just for your reference if you have not deducted the tds why because that person has an agent in india then also it is allowed but if tds is not deducted that person has doesn't have an agent in india also then this deduction will not be allowed so interest payable outside india shall not be allowed if tds has not been deducted or there is no agent in india under section 163 you don't have to remember 163 this is part of ca final syllabus but this is just for your reference okay next section is 25a 25a is recovery of unrealized rent because we understand what was unrealized rent it was a bed debt it was a bed debt there was a tenant he has not paid you uh, the rent and he has vacated he ran away so if sometimes it happens that in any few in any future year he comes back in any year he comes back in any subsequent year he comes back and he says sorry sir i have not given you the rent now i am i would like to repay it and now he is repaying this rent so this is recovery of unrealized rent it is same as recovery of bed debts or we can we, we also include the recovery of arrears of rent arrears of land, uh, rent is like there was a court case which was happening between you and your tenant and he was not increasing rent there was a court case and later on court decided yes the rent should be increased now that you are you have received the arrear of rent also which was not taxed in any earlier years so if you recover any arrears of rent or you recover any unrealized rent so that becomes your house property income in the year when this is actually received in the year when it is actually received why i am saying actually received let's say it is arrears of rent court has given the uh, this case in your favor they have to give given the decision in your favor and they say that okay arrears of rent should be received to you but you have not actually received it in this year so please don't make it taxable only when you have actually received it please make it taxable 
And please remember, whatever is the recovery of unrealized rent or recovery of areas of rent, only and only after giving 30% standard deduction, then you can uh, tax 70%. Only 70% will be taxed, 30% will be deducted, right? So if let's say if you have recovered 1 lakh rupees, so give a deduction of 30%, 30,000, 70,000 remaining would be taxable as house property income. It might also happen, happen that in subsequent year, when you have realized this rent, let's say you are not the owner of that property, you have already sold that property a year back or two years back, but still if you recover this rent, unrealized rent or areas of rent, even if you are not the owner of the property, that income will be deemed to be the house property income only. So it can, we can say that this is an exception of section 22. Section 22 say that there must be a building. But in this case, 25A, if you are recovering this amount, even if you are not the owner of that building in this year, in the year in which you are recovering this amount, this income will be taxed under house property. Getting it? But please remember, always give 30% uh, deduction from this and remaining 70% will be taxable. Give me a minute, guys. Okay, next part is if you have multiple units, if you have multiple units or you have different portions which you are using it for different purposes. Let's say in your examination question, it is mentioned that one third of the portion is being used for self-occupied. One third of it is used for, uh, let's say for let out and one third is used for own business and profession. So how you will approach to this particular type of question? You will split your calculations. You will split your calculation. For self-occupied portion, you have to compute it separately. For your let out portion, please compute entire thing separately. And if it is given in the question that some portion is used for business and profession, you understand you don't take that portion in your house property. You have to take that in your PGPP. Let me take an example. Let's say in your exam, there is a question which comes to your, in your examinations that there is a property. Okay. There is a property and it has three floors. One is ground floor. Another one is first floor and then second floor. So this is ground floor. This is first floor, this is second floor. Let's say ground floor is used in business, in a CSE's own business, okay. And first floor is self-occupied, okay. Second floor is let out, right. So there is only one house, but it has different portions. Let's say each has equal area, one third, one third, one third. So what I'll do is I'll make all the calculations which uh, related to that particular portion and I'll split them into one third, one third, one third each. How I'll do this? So we understand for business, whatever your expenses are uh, taking place or any income which is related to this ground floor will not go in house property, it will go in PGPP, correct? So only these two portion which is self-occupied and let out will come under house property income. So what I'll do is I'll make different columns. So I'll not take PGBP while computing your house property income. I will not take this ground floor because this is related to business. I'll make different columns for self-occupied portion and for let out portion. You understand? You remember this? So you will make one is for first floor that is self-occupied. And another one is your let out. So you will write your format, your format is GAV, you have to calculate, then you have to subtract municipal taxes, you will get NAV, NAV and after that 24A deduction, 24B deduction you will give and after that you will get your house property income. This is your format. And for self-occupied portion, we understand that we take NAV as nil. So for self-occupied portion, there is no problem, we can take NAV as nil. And we have to ignore this GAV and municipal taxes because for self-occupied NAV is a starting point. But for let out portion, your GAV is a starting point. So first you have to calculate the GAV of the entire house, right? So how is GAV calculated? Expected rent or actual rent, whichever is higher, that is called your uh, GAV. So if let's say if in your question expected rent is given for the entire house, for the entire house it is given, let's say it is given 9 lakh rupees is the expected rent for the entire house. So this is for the entire house and for this let out portion is just one third, right? Self-occupied is also one third. So let out portion is out of three floors. This is just one third. So if nine lakh is the expected rent for the one third for the entire house, you just have to take only one third portion, only that portion, which is 
one third, one fourth, whatever it is given in your examination, right? So whatever is mentioned in your question. So in that case, my expected rent for this portion will be attributable only to 9 lakh into 1 upon 3, that is 3 lakh rupees. So you have to compute your GAV accordingly. In the similar manner, if uh, municipal taxes is given, let's say municipal taxes is given 45,000 for the entire house. So please split them into these different portions, split them into different portions. So it means 15,000, 15,000, 15,000 is related to these three, right? If it is related to your business 15,000, that will be your business expense. If it is related to your self-occupied property, we understand we don't take municipal taxes in self-occupied property. You can mention it by notes that for self-occupied property, the starting point is NAV. And for this, the entire house, it is 45,000. And for this let out portion, we can subtract municipal taxes, but only which is related to that portion. That is 15,000. So you can take 15,000 rupees. You can subtract that. Correct. And that way you will get your NAV. 24 is, is there is no problem. Whatever is your NAV, give 30% of that. 24B, 24B, same way you have to split. Let's say uh, for the entire year, the interest comes out to be 6 lakh. If the entire, for the entire year, the income, uh, the interest comes out to be 6 lakh. So apportion this interest between these three. So if it is one third, 2 lakh, 2 lakh, 2 lakh each. For business, it will go as a business expense. For the self-occupied property, if you are following default regime, then please don't give any deduction under 24B because that is self-occupied property. We don't give 24B in case of self-occupied property, right? And if which is related to let out, we can give how much it is? 6 lakh into 1 upon 3, that is 2 lakh rupees. 2 lakh rupees you can take as an interest. So this is how if a property is used differently for different uses, you have to split your computation. Please sep please compute your house property income separately for each portion. Correct? But if the entire house, let's say I have a house which has ground floor, first floor, second floor, you have a house which has ground first or second floor, but you are using your entire house as self-occupied, then there is no need to split. Correct? Please, some of the students might get confused over here. Please don't get confused. It's very simple. You have to see whether it is used differently or not. If you have a two uh, floor or three floor house and entire house is, lit, house is let out. So it is used differently or only one use, only one use let out. Then you can compute for the entire house. You don't have to split the for every floor. You can compute for the entire house because it is used only for one particular thing. If it is entire house is self-occupied, there is no need to separate your calculation. Just do consolidate it, right? It is only when, when it is used differently, correct? So this is how you will calculate property with multiple units, with multiple uses. In fact, it should be multiple uses. Okay. Next section is section 26. Section 26 says if a property is co-owned, co-owned means there are more than two owners, two or more owners, two or more owners are there, then how you will compute that income? So first of all, you have to ask whether the ownership ratio, those who, who are the owners, whether their ownership ratio is defined or it is not defined. If it is not defined, not defined means that it is not able to, we are not able to ascertain how much a percentage each owner owns. So in that case, we will compute that house property income consolidated and this income will be computed, will be determined as if it is a association of person income, AOP's income. So you have to see whether the ownership ratio is ascertainable or not. If it is not ascertainable, it does. We don't know that how much portion each owner uh, owns. In that case, the entire house property income is assessed as AOP income. Right, because we don't know how much portion, how much percentage each owner possesses. So in that case, we cannot determine each owner income. Right, so in that case, it would become AOP income. But in case we know, generally, it will be given in your question that each co-owner is the owner of this much uh, portion or this much percentage. Let's say it is owned by two person A and B. Mr. A owns thirty percent. Mr. B owns seventy percent. If it is given that each co-owner or there are three owners, let's say uh, one, one is 50 percent owner, second is 25 percent owner, third is 25 percent owner. If it is given that the ownership ratio is mentioned over there, then how you will compute it? If the ownership ratio is ascertainable, if the answer is yes, sir, it is ascertainable. Then the second question which you have to ask whether the property is self-occupied or it is let out. 
So if the property is let out, then first compute for the entire house. Forget about that ownership, compute for the entire house and whatever income you have determined as house property income, you have to split that income. I'm again repeating, if the ownership ratio is ascertainable, the answer is yes, the ownership ratio is, we know the ownership ratio. Second question was whether it is let out or self-occupied. The answer is let out. Okay. So first of all, forget about that ownership. Just compute your house property income normally. Just compute your house property income normally. Whatever is your income now, just split that income in the ownership ratio. And this house property income, whatever the uh, that ratio is coming, whatever that portion is coming, just give it to each particular owner, right? So compute house property income normally and then finally distribute the income between the co-owners, correct? But in case, if the property is self-occupied, if the property is self-occupied, it is not let out. Ownership ratio is ascertainable, yes, but the property is not let out, it is self-occupied. Then in that case, you have to compute house property income individually, separately in the hands of each co-owner. What is the difference? In let out, first we are computing, then finally we are distributing the income. But here, from the very beginning, please compute the house property income separately in the hands of each co-owner. And if it, if it is let out, sorry, it is self-occupied, you take the NAV nil, 24A deduction would be again zero, 30% of nil is zero. 24B, if you are following default tax regime, there would be no deduction. If you are following optional tax regime, then you can give maximum 2 lakh rupees to each co-owner. 2 lakh or 30,000 as the case may be, to each co-owner. So for the entire house, should we give 2 lakh or for each co-owner? For each co-owner, you can give maximum 2 lakh, 2 lakh, 2 lakh each, right? But yes, please, uh, uh, first, please uh, also consider how much is the interest. If the interest is just, uh, let's say, 1 lakh or 1 lakh 50,000, only give up to that particular limit. 2 lakh is the maximum limit, right? But yes, 2 lakh could be if the if you uh, the interest is more. So you can give 2 lakh rupees to each co-owner. Let's say, uh, I give you an example. Let's say there is a house which is owned by A and B. And A is 40% owner, B is 60% owner, right? And they both are following optional scheme. They both are following optional scheme and it is self-occupied by both of them. So for A, we will compute separately. For B, we will compute separately. We will take NAV as nil. For A, nil. For B, also nil. This is for A, this is for B. NAV nil. 24A deduction would be nil, nil. 24B deduction. So let it depends upon interest. How much is the interest? Let's say I tell you the interest is 4 lakh for the entire house. The interest is 4 lakh. So for A, it would be 40%. So 40% is 1 lakh 60,000. For B, it is 60%. 4 lakh into 60% is it is 2.4 lakh. Right? So the interest is 1.6 lakh for A. B, it is 2.4 lakh. And if because they are following optional scheme, we can give 24B here. But if they would, would have been following default regime, then we will not give any deduction for self-occupied property. Okay. So for A, how much we can give? Sir, it is coming as 1.6 lakh, but maximum is 2 lakh. But we can give uh, lower of the two, that is 1.6 lakh. So for A, we can allow 1.6 lakh. For B, how much we can allow? He is following optional scheme also. So his interest portion is coming 2 lakh 40,000, but maximum is 2 lakh. So we can give 2 lakh each. See, so we are giving to each of them separately and maximum can go up to 2 lakh. But in A's case, the interest was just 1.6. So we can go, not give 2 lakh. We will give maximum 1.6 in that case. So there would be loss under house property in his hand. It is 1.6. In his hand, it would be 2 lakh rupees. Correct. Tell me one thing. Whether house property loss can be set off from any other head? Yes, sir, it can be set off maximum to 2 lakh. It can be set off maximum to 2 lakh from any other head. Although that is a question which is related to your set off of losses chapter. But still, you should know whether house property loss can be set off from any other head. The answer is yes, it can be set off from any other head, but maximum up to 2 lakh. If now it is important. If you are following optional regime, then house property losses can be set off from any other head and maximum up to 2 lakh, right? If it is more than 
2 lakh then it can it will be carried forward but only under optional scheme very important thing i am right now saying it it can come in your examination how shop if you are following default tax regime if you are following new tax regime 115 bac then house property loss cannot be set off from any other head in case you are following default tax regime so up to 2 lakh no it will not be set off from any other head it will be compulsory be carried forward in that case you cannot set off house property loss cannot be set off from any other head if you are following your default new 115 bac right if you are following optional tax regime you can set off it from any other head also but maximum up to 2 lakh remaining you have to carry forward but in new tax scheme you cannot set off from any other head that i'll discuss in set off chapter okay so this is an amendment you should know this right okay now last section it is section 27 deemed ownership so what is deemed ownership because we have uh, taken it in our uh, section 22 charging section i was just dis discussing this that there should be a building assessee must be the owner or if the assessee is a deemed owner also then also we will say it's okay we will keep it as a house property income so if assessee is not the registered owner but still he is a deemed owner also so what are the cases where the assessee can be a deemed owner this is mentioned in section 27 so let's discuss this as well so if a property is transferred to individual spouse if individual transfers their property to uh, his or her spouse without any consideration or inadequate consideration in that case the transferer is said to be the deemed owner only right the transfer is said to be the deemed owner so generally people just for the sake of avoiding the taxes for evading the taxes they generally transfer the property to their spouse so the registered owner becomes the spouse but we say if you have transferred the property without adequate consideration or inadequate consideration in that case the the owner would be deemed to be the transferer itself right so you cannot uh, save your taxes over there by uh, just using these tricks right so the assessee would be the uh, the remain the deemed owner but in case if there is a separation if there is a divorce which is taking place between uh, these two husband and wife so if you if a person transfers their property because as a consideration of living apart that is in the case of divorce in that case deemed ownership concept will not arise but yes if there is no such uh, living apart is happening just you are transferring the property without adequate consideration in that case the person who is transferring the property will be remain as a will remain as a deemed owner right house property income will be taxable in the hands of that transferer only similarly if you transfer the uh, ssc transfers the property to their minor child excluding minor married daughter if they are transferring it to the minor child then the parent who has transferred this uh, property will remain the deemed owner but if you have transferred it to minor married daughter then deemed ownership concept will not arise right but yes clubbing provisions will arise because in clubbing we see that the minor income whatever the income is of minor is clubbed in the hands of the parent income either of the parent whose income is higher that that we will see in clubbing but yes for minor married daughter deemed ownership will not arise but yes clubbing provisions will arise but for other minor child other than minor married daughter your deemed ownership concept will arise correct holder of impartible estate if there is any state where partition is not possible so the person who is taking care of that property who is the holder of that impartible state we will see we will assess that he is the deemed owner and we will assess the house property income in that particular hand a person who is a member of a cooperative society so you understand that in cooperative society what how does cooperative society form there are various members they form as a uh, they form they come together and form a cooperative society they get a cooperative society registered they purchase the land also in the name of cooperative society and there are so many uh, flats or any other uh, buildings which are built on that particular land who is the real owner who is the registered owner of that buildings the cooperative society but everybody invest that amount and in turn they receive shares in turn they receive shares although they are not the registered owner but they are a shareholder of that uh, cooperative society and for th and they hold such number of shares so that they can be the owner of the, any particular flat so in that case although it is registered in the name of co cooperative society but the person who is possessing those shares will be considered as a deemed owner right person who has paid the consideration 
and has also taken the possession of the property although it is not registered it is not yet registered in their name but still it will be considered as a deemed owner it it happens let's say if you are purchasing a flat any builder is selling you a flat he will take all your con all the consideration let's say the flat amount is of rupees 80 lakh you have paid 80 lakh rupees you have taken the keys also of that flat you have taken the possession also and the builder is saying that it will be registered in your name let's say after 6 months there is a small agreement which has uh, which has taken place between your uh, between the two between you and the builder and you have paid the amount also you have taken the possession also so you will be considered as a deemed owner although legally you are not the registered owner but yes if uh, can builder can deny that i will not uh, get it registered in your name no he will he cannot deny because you have taken uh, the possession also you have paid the consideration also and you must be having an agreement although not registered sale deed but still there is an agreement so if something uh, wrong happens you can sue him in the court and you can get the house registered also in your name that is not a problem but in but yes in this case till the time being the house is not registered in your name but still if you have paid the consideration you have taken the position you will be considered as a deep donor last thing if you have a leasehold right for more than 12 years then the leasehold owner becomes the deemed owner also so this was about section 27 some other points which i would like to discuss if can house property income can be exempt also we understand that agriculture income is exempt so if you have have agriculture land if you give this agriculture land on rent then the rent you receive is an agriculture income that is an exempt income even on that that land let's say there was a small room or there were two rooms which you have given it for agriculture purpose so that the person who is doing agriculture activities over there he can keep uh, his crops over in that particular room but there are two more than one room or two rooms also so if that building is used for agriculture purpose so the income which you are getting from that uh, rent from that building will also be considered as an agriculture income that is exempt and also if house property income belongs to any local authority political party trade union university approved scientific research institution that is also exempt okay the last concept is composite rent what is composite rent when you uh, give your property on rent plus with some other services also like security service like lift service or with some other assets also you give your property on rent so what uh, that tenant is paying to you tenant is paying you a combined rent which is consist of your building also and for other services or other assets also so how you will treat that particular income which you are receiving it so first of all the question should be asked whether this particular whether this particular property which you have uh, given on rent can you separate those two can you give property separately and those other assets or services separately if the answer comes no sir we cannot give it separately if it will be given on rent it will be given in a combined manner in that case the entire income will be assessed as pgbp or ifos generally it is ifos why pgbp because if uh, you are into that business who gives those particular other assets or other services uh, it is your nature of business if you are giving in the nature of your business then it will become pgvp income otherwise ifos but yes if they can uh, be let out separately if it if it is of such a nature that you can you can if you want you can give the property on rent separately you can give those other assets or the, those other services separately if the answer is yes then the rental income which you is received for related to building will be taxed under house property and for other assets or other services it will be ifos but yes sometimes it can be pgbp also if you are into such business of giving other assets or other services as a part of your business then it can come in your pgbp income also so if it can be separable if both can be so the summary is if both can be separated can be separable then related to building it will be house property related to other assets it will be ifos sometime it could be pgvp also but if it is not separable it is it cannot be separated you have given let's say an auditorium on rent but in auditorium there were chairs which are fixed to the ground there were some furniture which is fixed there is a screen which is fixed and you cannot give auditorium building separately once uh, you will be giving it on rent you have to give that screen that projector that chairs that furniture you have to give it so it is not it is 
uh, not uh, uh, easy to separate them together uh, so to separate them so what you have to do is you have to give it together right in that case the entire income which you will be receiving of that auditorium then it will be taxed under ifos but yes if you are into that business of giving uh, those furniture and all in uh, as a part in parcel of your business then it will be covered under pgpp income right so this is about composite rent so we have covered all these portions which we were aiming to cover so we know now section 22 is the charging section of house property 23 is how you will compute it first gav municipal taxes nav 24 a 24b house property income 24 deductions we have covered 25 is deduction not allowed if it is paid outside india tds or agent 25 a recovery of unrealized rent whatever or recovery of areas of rent whatever you will realize out of it 30 percent you will give a reduction 70 percent will be taxable as house property income even even if you don't occur possess that particular property right now in that particular year even then also it will be a deemed your house property income then you understand co-ownership how you will do your co-ownership if it is ratio is ascertainable or not and if it is ascertainable whether it is it is let out or self-occupied and deemed owner concept also you know vacancy period we will um, uh, compute the we will compare it with proportionate expected rent and we, when we will see whichever is higher if your expect uh, your actual rent is higher then GAV will be actual rent if your proportionate expected rent is higher then the GAV will be expected rent not PER it would be expected rent right you understand composite rent now property outside India for ordinary resident fully taxable for not ordinary resident or non-resident if it is received in India then it will be taxable and different uses also you understand that you will compute it separately so this was about house property uh, chapter and it was uh, all comparatively a uh, small and uh, easy and interesting chapter if you compare with your other heads but it is very important but please practice your question specifically i am requesting you that you should do just give preference first of all if you have a very less time please give preference to the question which is uh, on the back side of your uh, which is the practical questions which are mentioned in your uh, ICI material and if you have uh, some more time then also please concentrate on the questions which is asked in your past examination and uh, your MTP, RTP etc. Right. Okay. Let's meet in our next uh, lecture that would be on PGPP. Till then take care. Bye.